for uh, waking up to your mercies and loving kindness. Father, you're a great God. You, you, you're a wonderful God. You're our counselor. You're our mighty fortress to us, Father. And we seek you. We seek your face. We seek your word. We seek your wisdom. Um, we seek uh, guidance and correction, Father, as well, Father. We want to produce fruit for you, Father, for your kingdom, for you. We want to be pleasing before you. Father, we have great responsibilities as, as parents, as husbands, as men of the community. Father, we just ask you just to guide us um, uh, and show us how we can improve, how we can be uh, bear fruit for you. Father, we thank you for, for, for all, all the men in our group. We thank you for Brother Moy. We ask you, Father, for your guidance and the Holy Spirit to, uh, to direct us, Father, individually in our lives, Father. We thank you so much. We give you the honor and glory and praise, Father. In the name of Yeshua, amen. 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 So, buenos dias. Welcome, Chuck, and welcome both uh, to the class. We were uh, questioning ourselves if you were coming, <laughs> uh, as we knew mm -hmm. that yesterday was a heavy rain in, in Tunungwa, mm -hmm. and we didn't know about Wolf. Uh, Steve is um, traveling to Bogota, so he might not be able to make it. So, but let's get started with this uh, letter to Corinthians, the second letter to Corinthians. So, this this letter is a response to the first letter. It's actually what the first letter, uh, the effects of the first letter. One would think that this kind of letter, because we read it last uh, last week that is supposed to do a good effect in the community. It was like a huge exhortation for the community, but the effects weren't the ones that Paul expected. The response of the community to that letter was not as, as expected. So this second letter, Paul writes again, uh, maybe, and this is just a possibility, that you remember that the guy, there was a guy that was sleeping with his dad's wife, and that was addressed in the first letter. It, it might be a possibility that this guy was very influential in the community, maybe with money, with a lot of connections there, and he turned the community against Paul. Wow. Because this is kind of the things that are addressed here. It's not just that clear. But it's a huge possibility. When you read the letter and think of this, you come, oh, this, this is a good option of why, why, what happened in the community. Although we now know that uh, oh, we, we take this letter, the first, the first letter to Corinthians, we take it and we see that it's a very important letter for us. Hopefully not turning the communities upside down if we read it as we read it last week. Uh, but we can see that some communities are not receiving the message properly. They might turn themselves off, uh, mostly because of what their already dysfunctional living is. Because they are already dysfunctional, they turn the community off. Okay, so that's why we should be working in ourselves, working in our uh, refinement through, uh, before the Lord, so we don't turn communities off. <laughs> we, might, we might be the ones if we are not working and we are not paying attention to ourselves. So that's why we should be very concentrated and, and in our actions, in our inner being, and our fidelity to the Lord. Okay? Yes, Carl? Uh, quick question. How much time, do we know how much time passed between the first letter and the second letter? Uh, you know, the time seen in between the letters and actually between the whole Bible uh, is just an approximate, uh, but yeah, just, just a few years, <laughs> just a few years. I don't know if you have the dates from the last, the first letter. Do you remember the, the years, the possible years of the first letter being written? From I, last I, last? Haven't, I, I didn't screenshot it. I, I haven't screenshot it yet. Okay, so if you compare it, it's just a, maybe a few months or a few years. It's around the same date, okay? So this is the second letter, so let's read it out. Uh, so just a quick introduction here. Titus, which was the bearer of the letter on the first one, is the one who informs Paul of the result of his first letter. And based on that, Paul decides to write the second letter. 
maybe with this possible uh, problem that is happening. This is the letter of all the Bible where Paul talks the most about himself, about who he is, because they went attacking Paul, his, his, um, his ministry, his, he being an apostle, so they start, but possibly they attacked him and questioned his, his call. And this is why Paul is talking a, a lot about himself, about his own call. He's defending himself. So that might happen to us too. There might be a time if he, the, the Lord has called us that people or communities will doubt or question our, the reasons of our calling and go against us. So we should be aware of that too, okay? But we should be sure about our calling first. If we have been called, there is no way, if we, even if they attack us, uh, if the Lord has called us, we should respond to the Lord first, not to people. In this letter, we can see that there were four accusations to Paul. The first accusation was that he was a false apostle that he was not called, that he was not with Yeshua, that uh, he might made up all the things about his calling uh, from Yeshua, to, that he was a mercenary, because remember his past life, they might bring the past to the present and uh, argue about that, that you still are the same person as you were before. I love this word, this, this English word, I never knew it until the translation came being fickle <laughs> it's a very interesting word being fickle uh, that you are not firm that you are just changeable all the, all the time uh, they accused paul about that and that he was proud but not good proud uh, good pride but just being proud uh, selfish so that was another accusation to paul so th we can see that in this second letter so this letter is a manual that teaches us how to pass our faith and our ministry through the test of fire. It is a good idea actually to put our faith through the test of fire if we are uh, faithful or not through the Lord. So that's, that's, a, that's a good idea and actually this is the response. The second letter, it is a response to that first, uh, to that first letter. And remember what Peter says. Peter in his second letter, we will read it later uh, in, in, some, in a few weeks. Peter says this about the ministry and the calling. Therefore, brothers, try to make your calling and election even more firm. Because by doing these things, you will never stumble. We will see about what things is Peter calling. So let's see some overview of the second letter to Corinthians. As the first one is a letter to ha uh the Corinthians, written by Shaliach Shaul. It is a defense of Paul's ministry before his critics on the community of Cor Corinth. This is possibly this is this letter is being written in Philippi, not in Corinth. Around 56 AD, so maybe just a few months, a few. Uh, yeah, a few months after the first letter. And why is this letter uh, with us? Is to demonstrate with facts the legitimacy of Paul's ministry as an apostle and also a defense of Paul. We can divide this letter in three sections. The first section being the defense and proofs of Paul apostolate, chapters 1 to 7. Then a test of generosity, chapters 8 and 9. And then the conclusion of his defense, chapters 10 to 13. Okay, so let's open up our Bibles. Welcome, Steve, to the class. I see that you are driving, maybe. <laughs> Bienvenido, amigo. Uh, let's open up 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So... Chuck, can you help us out with chapter one, please? Yes, sir. From uh, Shaul, by God's will, an emissary of the Messiah Yeshua, and Brother Timothy. To God's messianic community in Corinth, 
along with all God's people throughout Asia. Grace to you and shalom from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Praise be God, Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, compassionate Father, God of all encouragement and comfort, who encourages us in all our trials so that we can encourage others in what in whatever trials they may be undergoing with the encouragement we ourselves have received from God. For just as the Messiah's sufferings overflow into us, so through the Messiah, our encouragement also overflows. So if we undergo trials, it is for your encouragement and deliverance. And if we are encouraged, that should encourage you when you have to endure sufferings like those we are experiencing. Moreover, our hope for you remains staunch because we know that as you share in the sufferings, you will also share in the encouragement. For brothers, we want you to know about the trials we have undergone in the province of Asia. The burden laid on us was so far beyond what we could bear that we even despaired of living through it. In our hearts, we felt we were under sentence of death. However, this was to get us to rely not only on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He rescued us from such deadly peril, and he will rescue us again. The one in whom we have placed our hope will indeed continue to rescue us. And you must add your help by praying for us. For the more people there are praying, the more people there will be to give thanks when their prayer for us is answered. For we take pride in this, that our conscience assures us that in our dealings with the world, and especially with you, we have conducted ourselves with frankness and godly pureness of motive, not by worldly wisdom, but by God-given grace. There are no hidden meanings in our letters other than what you can read and understand. And my hope is that you will understand fully, as indeed you have already understood us in part, so that on the day of our Lord Yeshua, you can be as proud of us as we are of you. So sure was I of this that I had planned to come to see you, so that you might have the benefit of a second visit. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia, visit you again on my way back from Macedonia and then have you send me on my way to Judah. Did I make these plans lightly, or do I make plans the way a worldly man does, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no, in the same breath? As surely as God is trustworthy, we don't say yes when we mean no. For the Son of God, the Messiah Yeshua, who is proclaimed among you through us, that is, through me and Selah and Timothy, was not a yes and no man. On the contrary, with him, it is always yes. For whoever, for however many promises God has made, they all find their yes in connection with him. That is why it is through him that we say amen. When we give glory to God, moreover, it is God who sets both of us and you in firm union with the Messiah. He has anointed us put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee for the future. I call God to witness. He knows what my life is like, that the reason I held back from coming to Corinth was out of consideration for you. We are not trying to dictate how you must live out your trust in Messiah, for in your trust, you are standing firm. Rather, we are working with you for your own happiness. You can see that he is actually using the word, the words trial, uh, witness. You see, he he knows that he's being attacked, so that's why he's he's uh, saying these words like this. So interesting what he says about the yes and no, that the promises of the Lord are, are always yes. So it's interesting what it says about there. Uh, chapter two. Uh, I don't know if Wolf can read. I don't know if Wolf is available to read. Maybe yes. Maybe not. Okay, Carl, can you help us out read chapter two? Sure. Hey, Moises, I'm not quite with my Bible yet. I'll be there momentarily. Oh, okay, no problem. No problem, brother. Thank you. 
So I made up my mind that I would not pay you another painful visit. For if I cause you pain, who is left to make me happy except the people I have pained? Indeed, this is why I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not have to be pained by those who ought to be making me happy. For, for I had enough confidence in all of you to believe that unless I could be happy, none of you could be happy either. I wrote to you with, with greatly distressed and anguished heart and with many tears, not in order to cause you pain, but to get you to realize how much I love you. Now, if someone has, has been a cause of pain, it is not I whom he has pained, but in some measure, I don't want to overstate it, all of you. For such a person, the punishment already imposed on him by the majority is sufficient, so that now you, you should do the opposite, forgive him, encourage him, comfort him. Likewise, such a person might be swallowed up in overwhelming depression. So I urge you to show that you really do love him. The reason I wrote, to, wrote you was to see if you would pass the test, to see if you would fully obey me. Anyone you forgive, I forgive too. For indeed, whatever I have forgiven, if there has has been anything to forgive has been for your sake in the presence of the Messiah, so that we will not be taken advantage of by the adversary. For, for we are quite aware of, of his schemes. Now, when I went to Troas to proclaim the good news of the Messiah, since a door has been opened for me by the Lord, I could not rest because I failed to find my brother, Titus. So I left the people there and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in the Messiah constantly leads us in a triumphal procession and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of what it means to know him. For, for to God, we are the aroma of the Messiah both among those being saved and among those being lost. To the latter, we are the smell of death, leading only to more death. But to the former, we are the sweet smell of life, leading to more life. Who is equal to such a task? For we are not like a lot of folks who go about huckstering God's message for a fee. Very interesting. In the contrary, we speak out a sincere heart. As people sent by God, standing in God's presence, living in union with the Messiah. Why did you say very interesting? What, what popped out in your mind? Because you know, you know, I search God's word, I do verse by verse studies, and I'm constantly looking for resources. And um and I, I want to make sure it's it's the doc the, the, the doctrinal background of the resources of I follow mm -hmm. because I want to know the truth as much as possible and I sometimes I use commentary and you know a commentary along with commentary brings on personal bias we all have them I do we all do mm -hmm. um, so uh, some of these places the resources. Uh, I, I want to look through people's studies and they ask for money. You know, it's, it's not, it, 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 out of my heart, I give, I give tithes and I give offerings to, to, to others. And, but when someone asks for money, I, I, I think of this, I think of this verse, you know? Um, so that's why I said that. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Forgive, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Actually, uh, so, so it's very important this exercise that you are thinking while you are reading and that should be done because you are thinking what you are reading so that's very important for every one of us because sometimes we just read and don't think about it and it's a good a good action to to start thinking okay let's go to chapter number three let me read it for you are we beginning to commend ourselves again 
or do we need, as some do, layers of recommendations to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, for Messiah, delivered by us, written not with the ink of, of, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Amazing. Such is the confidence that we have through Messiah toward God. Not that, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Ruach. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze of Moses' face because of its glory, which, has, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all, because of the glory that surpasses it. For, it, for if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will that in is permanent have glory. Much more will, will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to, to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Messiah is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Ruach, and where the Ruach of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is Ruach. Mm. Interesting, interesting mm. chapters. Uh, yes, Wolf? I just want to let you know I was ready to read. <laughs> oh, ready. Help us out with uh, chapter four, please. Okay. Therefore, since we have this ministry, just as we receive mercy, opportunities, excuse me, we do not get discouraged nor lose our motivation. But we have renounced the disgraceful things hidden because of shame, not walking in trickery or adulterating the word of God, but by stating the truth. We commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are perishing. Among them... The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving to prevent them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory and majesty of God in the face of Christ. But we have this precious treasure in earthen vessels so that the grandeur and surpassing greatness of the power will be from God and not from ourselves. We are pressured in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair hunted down and persecuted, but not deserted, struck down, but never destroyed, always carrying around in the body the dying of Christ, Jesus, 
so that the life of Jesus also may be shown in our body. For we who live are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be evidenced in our mortal body. So physical death is at work in us, but life in you. Yet we have the same spirit of faith as he had, who wrote in scripture, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised the, the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. For all things are for your sake, so that as grace reaches to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not become discouraged. Though our outer self is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light distress is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. So we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are visible are temporal, but the things which are invisible are everlasting and imperishable. Thank you. Thank you, Wolf. So, yeah, it's amazing. And actually, we can see that he is taking off the focus on his person and bringing bringing it to God. And actually that might be the best defense of all. It's not, look, don't, do not look at me, look of who has saved us, look at who has given his life for us. Interesting. Let's go to chapter five. Uh, I don't know, Chuck, if you are still there, can you read us chapter five? Might not be there. <laughs> well, Carl, yet again. Sure. Chapter 5, please. We know that when the tent which houses us here on earth is torn down, we have a permanent building from God, a building not made by human hands to house us in heaven. For in this tent, our earthly body, we groan with desire to have around us the home from heaven that will be ours. With this around us, we will not be found naked. Yes, while we are in this body, we groan with the sense of being oppressed. It is not so much we want to take something, take something uh, of, off, but rather to put something on over it so that we must die, so that what must die may be swallowed up by the life. Moreover, it is God who has prepared us for this very thing. And as, and as a pledge, he has given us his spirit so that we are always confident. We know that so, that so long as we are at home in, this, in the body, we are away from our home with the Lord. For we, for we live by trust, not by what we see, we are confident then and would much prefer to leave our home in the body and come to our home with the Lord. Therefore, <clears throat> whether at home or away from home, we try our utmost to please him. For we must all appear before the Messiah's court of judgment, where everyone will receive the good or bad consequences of what we did while he was while he was in the body. So it is with the fear of the Lord before us that we, we try to persuade people. Moreover, God knows us as we really are. And I hope that in your conscious, consciousness, you too, you too know us as we really are. We are not rec recommending ourselves to you again by giving you a reason to be proud of us so that 
you will be able to answer those who boast about a person's appearance rather than his inner qualities. <clears throat> if we are insane, it is not, is it, uh, it is for God's sake. If we are, if we are sane, it is for your sake. For the Messiah's love has hold of us because we are convinced that one man died on the behalf of all mankind, which implies that all mankind was already dead and that he died on behalf of all in order that those who live should not live any longer for themselves, but for the one who on their behalf died and was raised. So from now on, we do not look at anyone from a worldly viewpoint. Even if we once regarded the Messiah from a worldly viewpoint, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Look, what has become is, is fresh and new, and it is all from God. Who through the Messiah has reconciled us to himself and has given us the work of that reconciliation, which is that God in the Messiah was reconciling mankind to himself, not counting their sins against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of the Messiah. In effect, God is making his appeal through us that we do, what we do is, is appeal on the behalf of the Messiah. Be reconciled to God. God made this sinless man be a sin offering on our behalf so that in union with him, we might fully share in God. Oh, Carl just froze up. So he was about to, to end the, these verses. Let me just uh, give a quick word on, on this chapter. Uh, this is actually one of the only chapters in the whole Bible that speaks about the ministry. Uh, sometimes I, I'm pretty sure that you have seen the word ministry is the, it can be translated into service. Ministering is give, giving service to others. So there are lots of ministries out there. Uh, because they are giving service to, to people. But the only ministry uh, mentioned in the Bible is this one, the ministry of reconciliation. This is the service that we give to others. And this is, let me just read it out. Uh, verse 18, I think, yes. All this is from God, who through Christ, through Messiah, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So when we understand that our the service that we are giving others is to reconcile themselves with themselves first and then reconcile them with Messiah so they can be reconciled to, uh, with Messiah, this is the best service that we can give because this is the thing that it has been given to us to to the ones that have been called by him the ministry of reconciliation so this is one of the actions that actually is missing from lots of ministries lots of ministry the ministry of this the ministry of that the, the, there's lots of ministry but few actually work on the ministry the only ministry given to us the ministry of reconciliation so this is very important for us to uh, start taking action into, uh, like the main goal of, of service, servicing others is the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, so that's that's one of part of the part of the job, <laughs> part of the the work to do is reconcile others with themselves, and then helping them being reconciled with with God. Even though we are not doing anything, it's God Himself that reconciles them with Him. Uh, but we still have to work on that. Okay, this is the ministry also given to us. Yes, Steve, you have raised your hand. Buenos dias, amigo. Hope you're Buenos not driving. Dias. Oh, I am driving. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, I've, been, 
I'm I'm in a little town doing 10 kilometers an hour, so it's okay. Okay. Uh, um, can you just expound again on that reconciliation word, Paul? Uh, just again, because uh, when I think of reconciliation, I think it's like uh, uh, we reconcile all differences. We reconcile, um, you know, areas of fault that we see in others, and that they don't become so important. But but the reconciliation is that we just love our brothers, love our sisters the way they are. So am I on track with that? Uh, reconciliation, actually. When you think of reconciliation, first has to be a dispute, right? First, in order to reconcile, first has to be a dispute between two parts. So they can be reconciled again, okay? Reconciled. So bringing, bringing them back together. So they were apart because they, there was a dispute. So you reconcile again bringing them together. So the thing is that first we have to reconcile with our, ourselves because of the uh, past wounds, uh, emotional injuries, all the things that we have discussed in the previous sessions. Sometimes we are in dispute with ourselves. Some people actually kind of hate themselves or we are the worst, uh, how do you say, verdugo in English, uh, the worst punishers of ourselves because we are not reconciled. We're, we are against ourselves. So the first thing that we have to do is to reconcile ourselves with ourselves. So then we can reconcile with our Lord. We have disputes with, with our Lord. And if we think of our past life, there's, there's a, an amazing scene in the, in the movie Forrest Gump. I don't know if you re remember that, that movie. Uh, where these guys, the guy without legs, you remember that, that part, that he goes in the top of a of a boat and it's raining and the thunders are there and he actually starts blaming God and uh, he starts fighting against him. Every, th every time I, I think about this, uh, I, I do even cry in that scene because that was myself. I was fighting against God. So this ministry of reconciliation is reconcile ourselves with God. He wants to reconcile with us, but first we have to accept his his holiness and accept his uh, sovereignty uh, in order for us to reconcile with him so this is this is the 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 thing with reconciliation mr steve uh, that we bring back together two things that were apart so when you reconcile in your marriage is because you were angry with each other then you reconcile with your spouse okay so this is reconciliation is the the first and most important ministry in in the whole bible this is the ministry to help others first we have to go through the process ourselves to reconcile ourselves first uh, but then helping others to reconcile with themselves and with the lord and of course with the family if there, there's some split in the family uh, we should help us to give that service of reconciliation in those families is that helping you mr steve does, does that make sense Hopefully yes. Hopefully he's driving again. <laughs> Don't worry. You get back when you have uh, some more time. Okay. Yes, Wolf. You have raised your hand. Well, and coincidentally, uh, isn't that the purpose of Yom Kippur to reconcile us at this at this point of the year with God again? See, see, see. Actually, glad to uh, that you brought that thing up because yeah, the whole purpose and the main uh, muadim of the year is Yom HaKippurim. The reconciliations in, is actually in plural. It's not just one reconciliation. If you read the Hebrew in, the, in that part in Leviticus 23, is Yom HaKippurim, not okay. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is just one, but that's the Jewish ideology. The Hebrew, the Torah says Yom HaKippurim. So reconciliations in plural. And when you come like this, what reconciliations? Yeah, reconcile with yourself, reconcile with your family, reconcile with everyone, reconcile with God. So that's the Yom HaKippurim purpose. And the only the only time of the year when we can enter into the uh, Kodesh Kodeshim, the, the Holy holy of Holies, well, the, not ourselves, but the priest who went to the Holy of Holies, uh, because this is the most important thing that he wants to reconcile with us. Giving us, giving us access to this holy of holy place. 
So this is very important. Thank you for bringing it up, Wolf. Thank you. Uh, the, any other commentaries, guys? Uh, I saw Chuck, he raised his hand too. No? Everything is fine? Okay, well, let's jump to uh, chapter six. Chapter six. Uh, Chuck, can you read us uh, chapter six, please? Yeah, there we go. Sorry, guys, I'm having a couple of technical difficulties today. Chapter six. As God's fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive his grace and then do nothing with it. For he says, at the acceptable time, I heard you in the day of salvation, I helped you. We try not to put obstacles in anyone's path so that no one can find fault with what we do on the contrary we try to commend ourselves in every way as workers for god by continually enduring troubles hardships calamities beatings imprisonments riots overwork lack of sleep and food <coughs> oh excuse me Hello. we commend ourselves we commend ourselves by our purity knowledge patience and kindness by the ruach hakodesh by genuine genuineness of love and truthfulness of speech and by god's power we commend ourselves through our use of righteous weapons whether for pressing our cause or defending it though through being honored and dishonored praised and blamed considered deceptive and sincere unknown and famous and we commend ourselves as God's workers heading, headed for death. Yet look, we're alive, as punished, yet not killed, as having reason to be sad, yet always filled with joy, as poor, yet making many people rich, as having nothing, yet having everything. Dear friends in Corinth, we have spoken frankly to you and have opened our hearts wide. Any constraint you feel has not been imposed by us, but on your own inner selves. So just to be fair, I'm using the language of children. Open wide your hearts too. Do not yoke yourselves together in a team with unbelievers. For how can righteousness and lawlessness be partners? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What harmony can there be between the Messiah in Be Lial Al. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement can there be between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will house myself in them, and I will walk among you. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, Adonai says, Get out from their mists. Separate yourselves. Don't even touch what is in, unclean. Then I myself will receive you. In fact, I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says Adonai Zavot. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chuck. <clears throat> the, the verse 14 is very important. Do not be unequally yoked. So it doesn't mean that we don't have any kind of relationship. The thing is being in the same yoke, being associated with people that are non-believers. So this this is something also to, to consider. Let's go to chapter 7. Let me read it for you. Chapter 7. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Make your room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you. For I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort in I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, 
Our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by coming of Titus, by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. This is very important. You were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong. This is the, 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 key, uh, the key thing of, of the past letter. He wrote to someone, maybe this guy that we discussed earlier. Uh, so I, although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by, refreshed by you all. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of, your, of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Let's go to chapter 8. Uh, Wolf, can you help us with chapter 8? <clears throat> now, brothers and sisters, we want to tell you about the grace of God, which has been evident in the churches of Macedonia. For during an ordeal of severe distress, their abundant joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their lavish generosity. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily, begging us insistently for the privilege of participating in the service for the saints, not only as we had hoped, but <clears throat> first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he began it, he should also complete this gracious work among you as well. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in genuine concern, and in your love for us, see that you excel in this gracious work also. I'm not saying this as a command, but to prove by the enthusiasm of others the sincerity of your love as well. For you are recognizing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So that by his poverty you might become rich. I give you my opinion in this matter. This is to your advantage. Who were the first to begin a year ago, not only to take action. But also to desire to do it. So now finish this so that your eagerness in desiring it may be equaled by your completion of it according to your ability. For if the eagerness is there, it is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he has not, does not have. <clears throat> For it is not 
that others be relieved and that you be burdened unfairly, but that there be equality. At this time, your surplus is going to supply their need so that their surplus may be given to supply your need, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not lack. But thanks be to God who puts the same genuine concern for you in the heart of Titus. For Titus not only accepted our appeal, but was so very interested in you that he has gone to visit you of his own accord. And we have sent along with him the brother who is praised in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only this, but he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in regard to this gracious offering which we are administering for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our eagerness. We are taking precautions so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. For we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. We have sent with them our brother, whom we have often tested and found to be diligent in many things, but who is now even more diligent because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker in your service. And as for the brothers, they are messengers of the churches, a, a glory and credit to Christ. Therefore, show these men in the sight of the churches the proof of your love and our reason for being proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Wolf. Let's go to chapter nine. Carl, can you help us with chapter nine? There is really no need for me to write you about this offering for God's people. I know you are how I know how eager you are and how and I boast about you to the Macedonians. I tell them. Achaia has been ready since last year, and it was your zeal that stirred up most of them. But now I'm sending the brothers so that our boast about you in this regard will not prove hollow, so that you will be ready, as I, as I <clears throat> said you would be. For if some Macedonians, Macedonians were to come with me and find you unprepared, we would be humiliated at having been so confident to say nothing of how you would feel. So I thought it, it necessary to urge you, urge these brothers to go on to, to you ahead of me and prepare your promised gift in plenty of time. This way it will be ready when I come <clears throat> and, it, and will be a genuine gift not something extracted by pressure. Here's the point. He who plants sparingly also harvests sparingly. Each should give according to what he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Moreover, God has the power to provide you with every gracious gift in abundance, so that always, in every way, you will have all you need yourself and be able to pr prove, provide abundantly for every good cause. As the Tanakh says, he gave generously to the poor. <clears throat> His tzedakah lasts forever. He who provides both seed for the planter and bread for, the, for food will supply and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your tzedakah. You will, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in everything. And through us, your generosity will cause people to thank God because rendering his holy service not only provides for the needs of God's people, <clears throat> but it also provides in the many thanks people will be giving to God. 
In offering this service, you prove to these people that you glorify God by actually doing what your acknowledgement of the good news of the Messiah required, namely sharing generously with them and with everyone. And in their prayers for you, they will feel a strong affection for you because of how gracious God has been to you. Thanks to be to God for his indescribable gift. Thank you. Let's go to chapter 10. Uh, Chuck, can you help us with, with chapter 10, please? Now it is myself, Shaul, making an appeal to you with the meekness and forbearance that come from the Messiah. I, who am considered timid when face to face with you, but intimidating from a distance. But I beg you not to force me to be intimidating when I am with you, as I expect to be towards some who regard us as living in a worldly way. For although we do live in the world, we do not wage war in a worldly way, because the weapons we use to wage war are not world worldly. On the contrary, they have God's power for demolishing strongholds. We demolish arguments and every arrogance that rises itself up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive and make it obey the Messiah. And when you have become completely obedient, then we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience. If you are looking at the surface of things, if anyone is convinced that he belongs to the Messiah, he should remind himself that we belong to the Messiah as much as he does. For even if I boast a little too much about the authority the Lord has given us, authority to build you up, not to tear you down, I am not ashamed. My object is not to seem as if I were trying to frighten you with these letters. Someone says, his letters are weighty and powerful, but when he appears in person, he is weak. And as a speaker, he is nothing. Such a person should realize that what we say in our letters, when absent, we will do when present. We don't dare class or compare ourselves with some of the people who ad advertise themselves and measuring themselves against each other and comparing themselves with each other. They are simply stupid. We will not boast about what lies outside the area of work which God has given us. Rather, we will boast within our assigned area, and that area does reach as far as you. We are not overextending our boasting as if we had not reached as far as you, for we did come all the way to you with the good news of the Messiah. We do not boast about the area in which others labor, but our hope is that as, you, as your trust grows, we will be magnified in your midst in relation to our own area of work so that we can go on to do even more namely to proclaim the good news in regions beyond you. I hope our hope is not to boast about the work already done by someone else. So let anyone who wants to boast, boast about Adonai, because it is not the Orle who recommends himself who is worthy of approval, but the one whom the Lord recommends. Oh, it's not the one. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's go to chapter 11. Let's go to chapter 11. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to, to Messiah. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Messiah. For if someone comes and proclaims another Yeshua than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that, that I am not in the least inferior of the super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in, spe in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. 
Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came to from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrain and I will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Messiah is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of, of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to determine, undermine the claim of those who, who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, dis disguising themselves as apostles of Messiah. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I, said not, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Messiah? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift in sea, at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless night, in hunger and thirst often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure of, on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Yeshua, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor on the, under King Agaretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Let's go to chapter 12. Uh, Carl, can you help us with chapter 12, please? I have to boast. There is nothing to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in union with the Messiah who, who 14 years ago was snatched up to the third heaven where he was in the body or outside the body. I don't know. God knows. And I know that such a man, whether in, in the body or apart from the body, I don't know. God knows. Was snatched into Gan Eden and heard things that cannot be put into words, things unlawful for a human being to utter. About such a man I will boast, but, but about myself I will not boast, except in regard 
to my weaknesses. If I did want to boast, I, I would not I would not be foolish because I would be speaking the truth. But because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, I refrain so that no one will think more of me than what my words or deeds may warrant. Therefore, to keep me from becoming overly proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from the adversary to pound away at me so that I would not, so I wouldn't grow conceited. Three times I begged the Lord to take this thing away from me, but he told me, my grace is enough for you, for my power is brought to perfection in weakness. Therefore, I am very happy to boast about my weaknesses in order that the Messiah's power will rest upon me. Yes, I am well pleased with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties endured on the behalf of the Messiah. For it is when I am weak that I am strong. I have behaved like a fool, but you force me to do it. You who should have been commending me, for I am in no way inferior to the super emissaries, even if I am nothing. The things that I prove, I am an es emissary, signs and wonders and miracles were done in your presence, despite what I had to endure. Is there any what is there any way in which you have been behind any of the other congregations other than in my not having been a burden to you? For this unfairness, please forgive me. Look, I am ready this third the, this third time to come and visit you. And I will not be burdened to you. I will not be a burden to you. For it is not what you what you own that I want, but you. Children are not supposed to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. And as for me, I will be I will most gladly spend everything I have and be, be spent myself too for your sakes. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Let it be granted then that I was not a burden to you, but crafty fellow that I am, I took you with trickery. Was it perhaps through someone I sent you that I took advantage of you? I urged Titus to go and, and sent the brother with him. Titus didn't take advantage of you, did he? Didn't we live by the same spirit and show you the same path? Perhaps you think that all this time we have been defending ourselves before you. No, we have been speaking in the sight of God as those united with the Messiah should. And my dear friends, it is all for your upbuilding. For I am afraid of, of coming and finding you not the way I want you to be. I want you to be, and also of not being found the way you want me to be. I'm afraid of, find, of finding quarreling and jealousy, anger and rivalry, slander and gossip and arrogance and disorder. I'm afraid that when I come again, may, my God may humiliate me in your presence and that I will be grieved over many of those who have sinned in the past and have not repented of the impurity, fornication, and debauchery that they have engaged in. Very interesting what is Paul saying here. Uh, you, you can see there's an economic issue here that they were maybe not giving money or they were feeling that they were being deceived. And the last thing that he says here, uh, I have to mourn over many of those who have seen earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality that he was discussing on the first letter, remember? So mm -hmm. this, is, this is about the same, the same thing. Okay, let's go to last chapter, chapter 13. Wolf, can you help us out with uh, this chapter 13, please? This is the third time that I am visiting you. Every fact shall be sustained. 
sustained and confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have already warned those who have sinned in the past and all the rest as well. And I warn them now, even though I am absent, as I did when I was with you the second time, that if I come back, I will not spare anyone. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in and through me, he is not weak or ineffective in dealing with you, but powerful within you. For even though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we too are weak in him, yet we are alive and well with him because the power of God directed toward you. Test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in faith and living your lives as believers. Examine yourself, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit? But I hope you will acknowledge that we do not fail the test, nor are we to be rejected. But I pray to God that you may do nothing wrong, not so that we may appear to be approved, but that you may continue doing what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. <clears throat> for we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad when we, we are weak, but you are strong. We also pray for this that you be made completely, you may be made complete. For this reason, I am writing these things while absent from you, so that when I come, I will not need to deal severely in my use of the authority which the Lord has given me for building you up and not for tearing you down. Finally, believers rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace. And the God, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people greet you. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you, thank you all. So this this last this last chapter is so important for all of us. Uh, but let me just point out the verse nine. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration or your completeness, your shalom, is what we pray for. So this the whole purpose of this letter is to work to, towards that to the restoration of the individual and of the community. So very interesting letter. So let's go to the key verse of this uh, second letter to Corinthians, which is the next one. That, that would be verse number five in this last chapter. Examine yourselves if you are in emuna, in fidelity. Test yourselves. We were discussing that in the earlier uh, sessions, right? Test yourselves. Or do you not recognize yourselves that Yeshua the Messiah is in you unless they are disqualified? Very interesting, very interesting letter uh, and everything that Paul is commenting here. I don't know, any, any questions, contributions, allegations, disputes or anything that you may want to add to this, to this second letter? No? Okay, yes, uh, yes, stop. There, is it working now? Si. Yeah, sorry, I, I can't find the button to raise my hand on my phone. I can only find that on my tablet. So, um, I have a question about the, oh no, did I just disconnect you? No, oh. I, you're okay. Oh. So a question about the reconciliation stuff. Mm -hmm. I, under, I understand the reconciliation between, you know, within myself and with, with, with the father, right? Mm -hmm. the, the part about reconciling with others, other people, if you've attempted that, 
but still as a man see that it's better to what's what I'm looking for here. Um, it's not, it's not going to work. You know what I mean? Like maybe, maybe you see something within someone that you think, you know, maybe it's just better that I don't even affiliate myself with, with someone of that character. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you feel like you can't reconcile that. Where, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line in that? How, how do you make the determination whether you should continue or it's just, it's time to, uh, to just say, you know what, I'm going to leave it up to him and I'm going to step away. Uh, okay, the, there are the, the, this is where the class of limits and boundaries comes into place. Of course, there there is sometimes that you cannot deal with the person again because they might be, I don't know, maybe they threaten with killing you or something, no, something very bad that you cannot make any reconciliation with them directly. But, and actually there's another verse I, I can remember now, maybe one of you guys remember. As long as it's up to you, be in shalom with everyone. There's a verse that, that says uh, about that. So the reconciliation comes within you. If you can make amendments with someone and you can reconcile directly with the person, uh, do it. And of course, it has to be prayed before. You should pray about it before. If you know that there's something inside you, that there's something that you cannot, I don't know. And the Lord will just um, uh, make the situation that works out in order for you to reconcile. Mostly if he is actually instructing you to reconcile directly with the person, even if there's a threat, even if there is something very bad that you cannot, that you think in the, your human way, that you cannot reconcile, but the Lord is telling you to reconcile with that person, then you go and do it. The, independently of what the other person or how the other person reacts or does, it doesn't make that you are going to make a long lasting, beautiful relationship after that. You will just reconcile, make peace, make amendments, and then just keep walking in, in the Lord's way. Does that make any sense, Todd? Yeah, I, I think well, more to the point of, well, I guess my question was, is, you know, I, I'm always able to forgive and move on, but you also, in a situation like that, you have to set your limits and not allow negative impact on family. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. yeah, you got sometimes you got to be in, you know, father mode, protection mode look out looking out after your family not allowing that that negative influence to impact others you know what i mean so ultimately you know for, forgive and and move on that's that's absolutely doable i get that i'm just wondering where you draw the line or you find just say you know what enough is enough you know and of course it does come through prayer i, I get it oh yeah See, yeah, yeah it's very important to pray before and actually let me let me tell you uh, uh quick thing that happened to me. Uh, I get into a very bad argument and very bad uh, fighting with uh, one aunt of my of my family. He even cursed, she even cursed me and she just proclaimed a lot of things about me. Of course, I fought back on that time and this happened like 20 years ago. And even though 20 years have passed, the Lord set us in the same place at the same time, 20 years after that, and we were able to reconcile, to make peace, to make amendments. And we still draw the line of the limits, but we were able to make peace, to reconcile. And she's living her life, I'm living my life, but I know now in my heart that I was in peace because every time we, in classes or wherever I discuss the, the the theme about uh, forgiveness and reconciliation she always came to my mind and the the lord was telling me you have to reconcile you have to reconcile with her and i didn't know even how to look for her because she was missing uh, a lord i didn't have even the means to to reach her out but the lord set us up in just a few hours in the same place at the same time and we were able to reconcile to make peace and then we just part away 
So when, when if it's required and the Lord is giving you this sense of you need to reconcile with someone, pray about it, and He will set up the time and place when you can reconcile and then just part away. Okay. One more friends. Any anything else? Let's go to the practical part. The practical part has to deal with this. Yes, Chuck. Yeah, just a, a, a quick one, Moe. I've been trying to put my thoughts together on uh, on this. And, you know, sometimes I'm a, I'm a slow thinker. <laughs> um, when it comes to reconciliation, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've had times in my life, uh, I'm thinking specifically about a problem years ago in, in, uh, uh, with my mother and, and, and my brother and some crazy stuff that happened. Um, uh, that really split up the family for, for a while. In fact, it's still going through a healing process. Um, uh, uh, you know, Yeshua says if, if uh, uh, you go to the temple to, to, to leave your offering and, you know, uh, your brother has something against you, go and be reconciled. Go and reconcile with, uh, with your brother first and then come back and make your offering. Um, uh, he, he doesn't say that, that, uh, uh, your brother has to reconcile with you. Doesn't say that your brother has to make things right with you. It, it says you have to make things right with your brother. Now, uh, in my personal experience, um, uh, you know, those reconciliations just aren't accepted, you know, um, uh, uh, uh or at least they weren't at first in some cases. And I've realized a lot of times that it, it takes time um, uh, for the other person, right? It's not an instant, okay, I've made up my mind. The Lord spoke to me. I need to go and, and do this. It doesn't necessarily mean that the Lord has spoken to the, the, the other person yet, I don't think, um, or ever will possibly. Um, uh, and uh, it's interesting because uh, the kids in one of their Bible studies yesterday, um, they were watching uh, the Bible Project. I'm not sure if you guys have ever watched the Bible Project. Oh, the Bible projects are great, and uh, they had a they had a new one out specifically about um, um, about that, um, or at least it was new for me. Talking about turning the other cheek and and uh, you know carrying the soldier's pack for an additional mile, and the reason uh, for that was to leave the person who was 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 hurting you in a position where um, uh, you know. A, they had to treat you like an equal, and B, um, the guilt that would come upon them because they were trying to hurt somebody who was trying to do so much good, right? And sometimes I think that's a necessary ingredient in, in reconciliation. Or like, um, you know, I try to teach the, 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 the kids looking at a, at a worldly, you know, perspective. If two countries are at war, and we see this all the time, and uh, they declare peace and the two governments declare peace, both of those governments have to be ready and willing to continue to be shot at by some of the soldiers on the other side, okay, without going back to war. You know, um, when you're trying to reconcile with someone yourself, you have to be prepared to, you know, hear some, some nasty comments in your direction afterwards, take some extra insults, some extra hurts, some extra things going on, until they realize, oh, they really have entered into a time of peace, right? And, and I don't know if that, uh, uh, that helps a lot or makes any, um, uh, 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 any sense, but I think there is a, 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 a timing perspective that's not necessarily a human timing perspective um, when it comes to, to reconciliation. What, what, what do you think about that? I, I totally agree with that. Um... We just have to be, uh, how to say, available to do that. We have to be uh, willing to do it, even though, of course, forgiveness has to come first in ourselves in order to make reconciliation with other person. Uh, so the inner work patience. Has, is, 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 yeah, patience and forgiveness, and then we can reconcile with others. The thing is, and actually the, the practical part will help a lot, uh, sometimes we just work in our inner world, in, in our thoughts, in our feelings, but we do not express them outside. So we know we are loving persons, but we do not show love. love. 
we know that we are forgiving persons, but we don't show this forgiveness to others. So it has to be congruent, it's an English word, I think, yeah. Congruent that what is happening inside must show outside. If you have forgiven someone inside, you have to show it and actually tell them. Of course, prayer has to lead the way. He has to lead the way. Sometimes it's not possible, and I totally understand. Sometimes it is not possible for, uh, mostly what happened, for example, uh, if my mom or father has passed away, if they have died, how would I, how would I reconcile with them if they are they have passed away? So uh, there's no way I can reconcile because they they have died. So, but even though there's something inside that has to work first and then sh be shown outside. Sometimes you won't be uh, physically able to do it, but when needed, the Lord will just set the time and place. And yeah, as you say, Chuck. Sometimes we still might have something going back, but if we are in shalom, in real shalom and real forgiveness, then we won't fight back. We won't start over the fight again. So yeah, I completely agree with you. Okay. Well, and let's go to the practical part now. So sometimes, and actually there's a very famous song about it. You may say, I'm a dreamer. <laughs> I am not the only one. Uh, sometimes we men, we women, we tend to come very practical, very into action, very uh, doable things. But sometimes we are very dreamers. Our inner world, in our inner world, we are very dreamers. We think about and we dream a lot and we imagine a lot, even though we are practical in some sense. But the thing is that sometimes we do have lots of ideas ideas of forgiveness, ideas on how we should do things, in, in ideas in buildings. We do have lots of ideas that are not brought into action. And sometimes the Lord is giving us the ideas to do something. So this is the, the, the practical part of this, is how to bring those ideas into action. From the idea to the execution because sometimes we have great ideas, we have just great plans, we have lots of intentions, but not any actions. So we should go from the idea to the action, to from the idea to the execution, if the Lord is leading the way, of course. Not to bring all your ideas into action, it's just bring to action all the ideas that the Lord is putting into, into your mind. So there are some steps <clears throat> for actually to have a very efficient process from idea to action. From, so when you have an idea and the, you know for sure that you have prayed about it and the Lord is giving you the idea to do something, then step number one would be to establish the goal. Where are you going? What is this, this idea and this action? going to send me. I will not end up in the same place. I will be going to some place. Where am I going? What is the goal of what is the purpose of this idea? If we don't have clear, but sometimes we have an idea. Uh, I don't know if this might happen to you <laughs> in your marriage. Oh, I have this great idea and I just brought a 50 inches TV and I just brought it home. And your wife is like, what? <laughs> Why did you bought that? What, why, why, what were you thinking? What was the goal or the purpose of this? I know Carl is laughing because that might happen to him. Yes, brother? <laughs> it has happened to him. I feel yeah. your pain. I feel your pain. <laughs> so sometimes we do have ideas. We take them to action, but there's no goal. So we should think first. What is the goal? What is the purpose of this idea brought into action? Where are we going? Where are you going with this idea? Set the goal first. Then, it is very important for us to make deliberation with prudence. What is deliberation? If this is, if this is a good thing, if it's not a good thing, what does it take to reach that goal? Do I need money? Do I need some kind of materials? Do I need to ask for permissions? 
we should make this deliberation with prudence. And in this point, we are not uh, we are not taking uh, we are not executing the idea yet. We are just deliberating uh, with prudence, a very good ingredient. If it's a good idea to bring this to action, it is necessary to seek advice of the Lord first, and then consult somebody that is expert on the on the matter. It is a good idea to make this. Of course, God will lead the way, but sometimes the people that has gone through the same thing can help you a lot. This is actually uh, connecting with with what we discussed in the in the Second Corinthians letters. It is a good idea to share one another uh, how to do things. What do you think about it? Somebody that can lead you and connect you to the outcome, to the possible outcome of the idea. And then we take the decision. Once we have, we know the goal. And once we know what it takes uh, for taking that idea into action, then we take the decision. What is taking the decision is the rational determination between two options, with at least two options. If I do this, this is going to happen. This might be happening. If, if I don't do this, what will happen? Let's talk about re the reconciliation thing. If I'm going to reconciliate with this person, what is the purpose of it? Then deliberate with someone, take advice, and then take the decision. Are you going to do it or not? You see, it's as, it's as simple as that. It's bringing some ideas in yourself to the outside. Take the decision. Determine rationally uh, between two options. You are going to do it or you are not going to do it. But this is not the, the whole thing. Once you have taken the decision of doing it, if that's the case, then go to the execution part. Sometimes, I've seen it through years, uh, Sometimes we have a great idea. We have taken the decision of doing it, but we do not execute it. It just stuck there in the process. And we are determined. We know for sure that we are going to do it, but we never do it. So the, ex the execution part is very important. Start. Just simply do it. Start and do not stop unless there's a transgression of the Torah or there's imminent damage to your own beings or to someone you love. Just stop there. But once you start, do not stop. Do not stop unless there's transgression. And by transgression uh, to the Torah, I mean by the written things in the Torah. But also maybe the Lord is telling you to stop. And if we don't stop and the Lord is telling us to stop, then that, that will be considered transgression. Okay, so but start. Sometimes we just not execute things. So the, the, the step after taking the decision is execute the idea. Okay, because we know what, ha, uh, what was expected to be taken. Let me just put it here. We have done this process before. So execute the idea. Yes, Carl? I, I like the way this is laid out. This is very good, and, and it, it follows the way men think and process things, we process uh, events that happen in our lives, things that we want to do. Also, I would just add in that, that sometimes when we make this, when, when we execute the decision, we will, we always kind of seek uh, like uh, validation that we're making the right decisions. But sometimes, uh, when we execute the decision, sometimes we're going to run across obstacles or events that we don't know about that will happen in the process of whatever we're trying to achieve. And sometimes I think that God uses that to grow us, to stretch us, to stretch us and to grow us and to test us and to, you know, because he wants, we want to bear fruit for him. And that sometimes it, it, there's difficulties we have to overcome, but that it causes us to improve. But just because we run across obstacles 
I don't think it necessarily means we make a bad decision. It's just that these obstacles that we will encounter that we didn't know about is a way of us growing into seeking and to rely on God um, for, for what, what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Yes. And sometimes that wa that's why it's necessary, the advice of somebody else, uh, because they might show up these obstacles that we might have not uh, for, foreseen. Uh, but sometimes even with taking advice and, uh, and consult uh, someone else, sometimes we will encounter these obstacles. And I, I agree with you. They are there just for strengthening, uh, strengthening our faith. So we will we will encounter obstacles, and sometimes the thing is that among believers, when we find an obstacle, we say, "Oh, the the, the Lord is closing the doors. I will not be able to follow through this idea anymore. The Lord is shutting down this idea." No, maybe it's just an obstacle for you to become more strong. Yeah. So that's why we should uh, understand this. Finding an obstacle is not necessarily that. Uh, we should not continue with the, the execution of the idea unless he's showing us that this is uh, a way to stop. So that's why the, the intimate uh, communion with the Lord is very important because he's leading the way. Amen. For sure, he will show us obstacles. He will present us obstacles in order for strengthening our faith. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Yes, Wolf. Yeah, just on a personal note on execution, I, I would want to break that down a little bit more. As you're executing, you're always going to need to continue to do analysis to see how things are tracking and possibly make a course correction. So you're looking at, okay, this is my plan. That's where I want to get. And now due to obstacles or maybe new information coming to light that you had considered before that wasn't available before. You know, you had to get past a per certain step to acquire certain knowledge and information. But at every one of those junctures, you need to kind of do a course correction based on this knowledge or my adjustment on this obstacle. I have to correct my course a little bit to, again to get still shoot for the goal. So it's a constant pro until you get to the end you're constantly correcting your course to make it to the destination. So thank you. Thank you. And yes, we're, we're going that way. We haven't, we haven't finished <laughs> with, the, with the slides. We are going exactly to, to that. OK, yes, Chuck? Man, this, I've, I've broken the screen to my phone, so Tom, so uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I have to push it like 20 times to get anything to work, so I apologize <laughs> for all the all the delays. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was going to say <clears throat> just a, a, a perspective from, you know, being out here in the middle of the jungle on a, uh, on, on a farm. Um, uh, uh, you know, previously in in life, I would uh, go through a process like this and and execute it, and finding obstacles. It, um, uh, they always seem to be, you know, what I thought at the time, man made or, or self made, right? Something that I had to get around. <clears throat> and then a few years ago, when when we started living out uh, out here, so close to the the uh, the land, so you know, where where you really have to realize the connection with with God and that everything is in his time for, um, uh, example, our, our, our first year, uh, here, we decided to grow coffee and spent months and months and months and, you know, uh, way too much money, um, uh, getting little, you know, uh, 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 uh coffee plants to grow 30,000 little coffee plants. I, we had coffee everywhere, right? Because in my own, you know, human mind not ever being connected to the land before we were just going to do it all at once and it was going to be great and it was going to be amazing right um of those thirty thousand, i think 200 of them are alive <laughs> 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 um a huge obstacle we we encountered all sorts of huge obstacles and um uh, uh um the obstacles were because you know, we weren't, or, or mainly me, I um, wasn't in God's rhythm, right? It wasn't God's time. 
Um, this is, you know, I wanted to plant when he, when it wasn't his time to send the reins. I wanted to do this because financially or, or, or business wise, it made more sense to do it this way in my own human perspective. That wasn't God's perspective. Um, and, and so just a little insight, um, in all these plans we make as men and executions and, and failures and triumphs and, and, and obstacles that, uh, uh, when God puts something on our, our, our heart to do something, um, I personally have a tendency to, oh, all right, it's on my heart. God said, do it, put on your shoes, run out the door with your hair on fire and, you know, have what my, uh, I've been called as rhino vision. Okay. And just kind of ignore everything else and run to the goal, uh, you know, uh, I think Chuck just froze up. Maybe the, an internet lacking there. Uh, but yeah, so there, there are two options here. Sometimes we are like a dreamer, so we just have a bunch of ideas, none taken into action. I got he's, he's back, I think. No, he's not. Uh, oh. and, and sometimes we do have a lot of actions, but never come to the process of thinking. Uh, he's coming back and forth. Uh, you have your internet, there's some lag in your internet, Chuck. Oh, probably, probably. Can, can you guys hear me now? We can hear you. No. Oh, yeah. That, there's it seems like so I'll finish up. But it, yeah, one of the things I've learned is is it, it's not so much running to the goal as fast as you can. It's uh, 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 walking towards it, maintaining the direction, and and keeping your ears open for the course corrections that God gives you along, uh, uh, along the way. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, to actually get to your goal anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. This is the Rhino vision is very interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if the Lord, the, if the Lord is leading the way, we should execute the things. Okay. Let me, let me bring you three ingredients, share with you three ingredients for the execution part. The execution part has to be very solid because if not it's a weak a very weak execution will not lead you to the to the goal of the idea so this this is called the three c's because they all start with the letter c the three c's of execution the first one is constancy sometimes we are executing the idea but we are not constant in the execution of the idea. The word constancy is the quality of being being there without moving. Just present yourself. Be there. Constant. Be there. Be there every day. Let's say uh, if you plan to do exercise, just be there. Present yourself. Is the quality, constancy is the quality of being without moving. Just be present. That's constant. Then the, um, the next C is continuity. Continuity is the quality of not being interrupted. Sometimes we are executing the idea, but it's not continuous idea. It's not continuous execution, sorry. We are, we are just interrupting. We check the phone. We just uh, lead with something else. We are not, we might be present. We are there, but we are not continuous in the execution of the idea. And the third C is consistency, doing it better every single time, doing it better than the last time. That's consistency, is the quality of achieving stability. So be there, do it continuously, and be consistent. That's the three C's of the execution of ideas. Because if not, we don't have these ingredients, <clears throat> sorry. If we don't have these ingredients in the execution, it will be a very weak execution. It should match up the, 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 uh, the energy of the idea with the work ha that has to be done to get this idea into action. So that's the three C's. <clears throat> and then if we have this and we have a very solid, a very firm execution of the idea, then Another ingredient is determination. Determination is the action and effect 
of accurately expressing the established limit that we are going to go this far, that we are going to reach this goal, that we, with this action, I'm deliberately going to this, to this purpose, I'm achieving this. And that will start, we will start seeing the results or the obstacles. What are we going to do? This is done after the execution, not before the execution. And then, we must sit down and evaluate the progress and the results. We should evaluate, are, are we really going into the direction that the Lord guided? Are we achieving the goal that the, the Lord was instructing us? Are we delivering the, the purpose of this idea, of this action? We should evaluate the progress and results. And then what Wolf was sharing is with with the evaluation, we should do corrections and rectifications. Learn from your own mistakes. Because nobody said that in the execution of ideas, everything was going to be perfect, smooth, very easy. No, we have to learn from our, our mistakes because mistakes are expected. Change the course if necessary. It is wise to change your mind. Sometimes you have to readjust because you are in the learning process of the idea, mostly in things that you have never done, like the coffee plants of Chuck. <laughs> it is wise to just change your mind or to set up a new limit. Maybe just lower down the limit or expand a little bit more the limit. This correction and rectification process is required in order for, uh, for the idea to mature, to evolve, okay? Let's discuss a very important action for us. To be a disciple of Yeshua. This is the idea, to become a disciple of Yeshua. Maybe we are disciples of Yeshua already, but we haven't really thought about the process of the idea of becoming a disciple into the action required to be a disciple of Yeshua. So let's read this together, and actually our Messiah, ourselves, we just in a very amazing and divine way. He will show us this in Luke 14, all this process in Luke 14, verses 25 to 33. So let me read it for you, Matthew, Mark, Luke 14. There we go, verses 25 to 33. And 25, there. The, the, actually, there's a small title there, The Cost of Discipleship. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sister, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He's telling us the cost. He's giving us the idea and telling us the cost. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation as, and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to all, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, "This man began to build and was not able to finish." Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him who comes against him with twenty thousand? And if not, while the other is yet a greater way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its, its, taste, its, its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or the, for the manure pile. It is thrown away. 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So he's giving us the idea, do you want to become a disciple of Yeshua? This is what it takes. And if you agree for what it takes, then execute the idea. With the three C's, determination, evaluation, and correction. Will face obstacles in that? Yes, of course. Our faith will be strengthened because of that? Yes, of course. But it takes a lot to be a disciple of Yeshua. It's just not knowing some verses here or there, or just uh, your own belief that you are a disciple of Yeshua. Some, some, I, I've seen some believers that they do have the idea, but they are not executing the idea of being a disciple. And this is what it takes. He just told us what it takes to be a disciple of Yeshua. So the the uh, the homework for this week <laughs> is for you to take this idea to be a disciple into the real action of becoming a disciple of Yeshua. There are some other actions that we need to take. And let me just share with you also these verses. Work, not for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because Elohim Abba sealed him. Then they said to him, What must we do to carry out the works of Elohim? Yeshua answered and said to them, This is the work of Elohim, that you show faithfulness in the one he sent. This is another idea, to show faithfulness in the one he, he sent. And this is the work that he is assigning us. To work not for the food that perishes, but the, for the food that endures for eternal life. If we see actually, if we see the whole Bible, is full of ideas. But when you take those ideas into action, that's when your life really starts to begin. Sometimes, and I've seen a lot of believers do that. They do have all these ideas about what is supposed to be living according to the Bible. But none of those ideas are being executed. Or maybe just some, in some way. We should take those ideas and bring them into action. So that's the whole homework for this week. Uh, I hope it goes fine with this homework because it's a tough one. And this is a tough one. Okay? Any questions, comments, contributions? Any other ideas? No? Okay, brother. So let's leave it up there. Uh, and let's let's pray. Okay? Todd, can you help us pray? Yes, I can. Abba, Father, we thank you for this time you've given us to come together uh, to partake in this class, Father. And we thank you for giving us the ability to, to come together as men. And to learn these these things, Father, through Moy, Father, we we thank we thank you for for the life of Moy and and the efforts he's putting into these these classes for us, Father, and we thank you for just blessing us with the ability to partake in these classes, Father. Father, we put this week before you, as we come into the this feast of the trumpets, Father. We ask that you give us the ability to open our minds, our hearts, and ears, Father, so we can rectify those things that we need to rectify within ourselves and. And come closer to you, Father, and rectify those things with others before we enter the high feast coming up uh, next week, Father. And we just ask that you walk with us and, and illuminate those things that we need to address in our lives, Father. We put this week in your hands, Father, and just ask that you send your angels around us, protect us throughout our travels, and uh, that we can all uh, gather here again next week, Father. In your mighty name of Yeshua's name, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. So, yeah, uh, sorry I didn't comment anything about it, but this uh, Wednesday night and Thursday is Jump Trua. So, I, I really hope in the Lord that you have a blessed Jump Trua. Remember the day to be alert, expecting his return. Okay? So, I hope you have a blessed uh, Jump Trua and, and a blessed week. Okay? God willing, see you next Sunday and have a very functional and blessed week okay Shabu take care